Good morning, Bucknutters. It is Sunday, January 17th, 2021. I am Dan Rubin. This is the Bucknuts Morning 5 on a Sunday. Our occasional weekend podcast and the off-season. The Dean of Ohio State Recruiting, Bill Curlick, will join us in just a few minutes. But we open on Sunday with the people's champ, Matt Baxendale. Bax, how are you dealing with post-college football? Well, you know, if you had told me that Ohio State was going to lose in the national championship game to Alabama before the pandemic hit and all this other stuff, I would have thought that my reaction would have been sort of a uh, a bit of a soul-crushing moment, right? I mean, we all remember the horror shows that were the Florida game and the LSU game, you know, 15 years ago where everybody questioned the state of Ohio State football, Kirk Herbstreit compared to Big Ten to the Mac, all that stuff. But the reality is, is I'm sitting here and I don't feel – anything like I did after those games. I'm disappointed, no doubt. This was only the fifth time in my lifetime Ohio State had to win a single game to be a national champion. But it doesn't feel like it's some referendum on the Big Ten or the program. In fact, I think all that went out the window the moment Ohio State drilled Clemson. There's no question they deserved to be in that game. There's no question they were the number two team in the country. They just ran into a really good Alabama team while they were shorthanded. At the end of the day, I think I'm sitting here grateful we even had a season. Because I think this could have been a, a really long fall, a cold, dark, long fall without Ohio State football. So, you know, I think there's a little perspective right now that normally we wouldn't have at the end of football season where we all cry and piss and moan and wonder how many days till the spring game. And, you know, with the year we've just gone through, I'm grateful we even had a season. It was difficult. And the obstacles were ones that I hope uh, the team and for that matter, the fans don't have to face again. But losing to Alabama the way they did in light of the injuries they suffered, I have no issue with it. And like you said, I really do believe this season will be remembered for the slaying of the Clemson Demon. That needed to happen. We appreciate Dabo Swinney making that W just a little bit more enjoyable. Let's turn the page, though, right now and say a little prayer that the situation is resolved with the pandemic to the point we can have, air quote, a normal football season coming up. The first question you have to ask with the Ohio State Buckeyes is, who is going to be the quarterback? Give me your idea of how you think that's going to play out. Well, I I think the, the elephant in the room is that Justin Fields hasn't yet declared. So we have to touch on this, even though I... I will be shocked if he doesn't declare and go off to the draft. But there's a lot of scuttlebutt out there right now that we all think Lawrence is the number one pick. And whether the BYU kid is the number two kid ahead of Justin Fields right now, it's it's a big deal because you have to wonder where Fields would end up going at this point. Now, I don't see any way Fields comes back because I think he's a top 10 quarterback or top 10 player in the draft, even if he is the number three quarterback. But you just never know, right? You just never know because if he goes, comes back and goes out next year, at that point he might actually be the number one overall pick. In fact, he'd be the odds on favorite to be the number one overall pick. So you have to wonder if there's a little bit of that calculus there too. But let's say Fields does the thing most of us expect and goes to the NFL. Well, you got a three way battle for the starting quarterback role next year between CJ Stroud, Jack Miller, both of whom are already on campus this year. And then, of course, Kyle McCord coming in as, as one of the top quarterbacks in the country, a top 30 player in America. And it's going to be very interesting to watch this play out because Ryan Day did a pretty good job of not tipping his hand throughout the regular season. You know, whenever the first game happened and they brought in a backup, the first one in was Jack Miller. The next time was C.J. Stroud. But I do think it was telling that for the Clemson game, when Justin Fields had to miss a play, Stroud was the guy in. So. You know, we're, we're going to be able to watch these two compete, along with McCord, of course, in the spring practice, and see who ends up winning the role. Ryan Day didn't have to worry about anybody transferring and leaving the program before he got a full spring practice set up to really get these young quarterbacks to be able to compete. And the reality is, I think, compared to where they normally would be, they're probably behind. But I think that's the case across the country. There was no spring football for them when they were enrolled early beyond, like, two practices. They didn't get a normal fall length season. They didn't get to come in and in the middle of a sacrifice game where they were blowing out Toledo or somebody, right? So I think it's going to be fascinating to watch this play out. Um, I know which of the three I think is going to start. That would be C.J. Stroud. 
I think he's the best suited for the offense. Again, barring a Justin Fields miracle, we have a three-way battle between three very young guys to decide who's going to be leading what could be another really good OSU team next year. I would agree with you that if you're doing the tea leaves Vegas odds on favorite right now, it would be CJ Stroud, but there's a long way to go. Protecting whoever wins the competition's blind side will be Thayer Mumford. I had talked to some NFL people who thought Mumford had raised his stock and become a second day pick. It won't be in this draft. He's coming back. That means you've got your left tackle set, Thayer Mumford, your right tackle set, and Nicholas petit Frere, who had a really good season. No, you haven't heard his name much. That's good. Josh Myers, on the other hand, opted to leave. So the three interior spots are open. How do you see those being filled? Left guard, center, right guard. Yeah, I'm shocked at Munford, especially with the back problems he previously had. You'd figure he'd be ready to go get paid right away. I'll admit I'm, my jaw is a little dropped in this one. I think nobody else was shocked more than perhaps Paris Johnson, who figured he'd slide right in to start at left uh, left tackle next year. So Paris Johnson's clearly going to be one of the starting guards next year, in my eyes. There's there's just simply no way that he isn't on the field. Um, you know, you have a guy who's shaping up to be a first round caliber talent, right? He's a top ten player coming out of high school. He had like three plays on the field against Clemson, and one of which he murdered a guy. So. This is a guy who is going to be on the field. He's one of the guards. I think Harry Miller is very clearly going to be the center. Look, look, there are some people who are going to complain about some of the stuff we saw from him in a weird year. They're going to remember the bad snaps against Michigan State because he hadn't snapped the ball hardly all year. Harry Miller will be fine, folks. This is a guy who's a five-star center for a reason. He wasn't bad at guard this year. He's going to be better with a normal year under his belt. So let's not jump on the Harry Miller isn't good train. And then I think the other guard's got to be Matt Jones after the way he played in the college football playoffs, down to the fact that they didn't put Harry Miller back in for the championship game. So as of right now, I'd be shocked if it was anything other than from left to right, Munford, Johnson, uh, Miller, Jones, and then NPF. Those are the guys to me right now on the line, and I really don't see it shaking out any other way barring injury. I wonder what they're going to do with Dewan Jones. It would be interesting to see Dewan Jones and Paris Johnson maybe start at guard and then kick out to tackle the next year, but it's definitely something we've got to keep an eye on. He'll be Mr. Utility is my guess. I think Dewan Jones is going to be the, like, the, the, the backup at four positions, right? He's the first guy on the field. I bet they have a package where he comes in as one of the tight ends just to run more people over. The Andre Tyree package, if you will, if people remember from 2005 against Michigan where OSU brought in the sixth lineman just to run heavy to surprise them. Dewan Jones is going to get on the field too. I agree. Let's finish with this. With the way the transfer portal is set up now, guys can move around without any penalty, but that can work in Ohio State's favor too. Do you see Ohio State making a big play in the transfer market to fill a position like, let's say, cornerback? If there's anybody capable of doing it, that's the problem is, is that, you know, OSU's got a lot of really good young players in the secondary that are highly recruited guys that, you know, they, again, didn't get a spring football when they enrolled early. They didn't get a normal fall practice. They didn't get reps against bad teams in September and blowout time to help them get more comfortable. So, you know, at this point, the secondary is losing Sean Wade. Um, and then pretty much everybody else is back for the most part. That was a major contributor. All of them are going to get through another year's worth of spring football. All of them are going to get better right, is already a pretty big overturning of starters from last year. So, sure, if there's a guy out there who can play, right, if there's a guy out there who is, you know, going to be able to step in and start at a place like Ohio State, then absolutely. But that's a pretty high bar to clear. And I know we're all frustrated with the secondary, which was unacceptably bad this year. There's no sugarcoating that. I mean, you finished 122nd against the pass at Ohio State. There's no excuse for that. And that has to be fixed for next year. But based on sheer talent, I don't know how many kids there are that are going to appear in the transfer portal that are going to magically be able to, you know, come play at Ohio State right away. I mean, if Stingley from LSU shows up in there, then, yeah, we'll fall over ourselves, right? But I, I hear people talking about, like, say, Elias Ricks, right? Oh, Elias Ricks wanted to go to OSU. What if he ends up in the transfer portal? Is he going to be any better than what we already have? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's the thing, is I think Ohio State has a lot of raw talent. And I think it's incumbent on the coaches to have 
these kids improve. And I think you have to hope that this, the situation on the ground allows for them to have the time to work with these kids to help them improve. Because I, I think, honestly, in a normal season where Ohio State would have played 12, 13, 14, 15 games, right? They played eight games, not 15 like you normally would to play in a championship game. If you had a normal spring football, right? You'd have had these kids in a better position in the secondary for OSU this year. And, you know, unfortunately, we didn't this year. And, unfortunately, Devontae Smith was also absurdly good. And that's going to be the last image we sort of all hold from this season. You go in next year, the number one concern we all have is the pass defense. I mean, like, in my eyes, nothing else is even close, not even replacing Justin Fields. So if there's a guy out there for that specific position, cool. Absolutely. Let's get a corner. But there's a very high bar to clear in my eyes as to whether there's somebody worth taking a corner, especially with all the kids that they have in terms of young talent. He's the people's champ. We appreciate him taking time out of his Sunday backs. Have a good one, brother. As promised, we are joined by the Dean of Ohio State Recruiting, Bill Curlick. Bill, did you lose any sleep last night knowing your heart is in the hands of Baker Mayfield? <laughs> No, not really. I uh, actually I, I I slept well because I stayed up late and then worked uh, after the Texas A State Championship game that Quinn Ewers played played in. So didn't get to bed till after after well after midnight. So slept just fine. And and the Browns were playing on house money anyway. You know who, who would have thought they were going to get this far? All is good. All is not so good with Quinn Ewers. He is the number one player in the country for his class, but his team did fall in the state championship game. No small feat, though, Bill, getting your team to a Texas state championship. And from what I have gleaned, his performance has done nothing to alter his ranking. I certainly wouldn't think so. Yeah, you know, He's still not 100%. He had the sports hernia, played the first four games of the season, and uh, then he had the sports hernia, had surgery, and came back. He had hoped to get that third win back from the play injury and all, but it didn't quite happen last night. Again, they were um, going against the defending state champs, an outstanding football team who also has a very talented quarterback. And, and despite – not being 100%, he still performed extremely well. 23 out of 39, I believe it was, for 352 yards and three touchdowns. Coming back from the injury, he wasn't the running threat that he usually is. He's usually an effective runner, too. Uh, but still, you know, it, it's all there, the whole the whole uh, package. And, and he's everything that Ryan Day is looking for in a quarterback. And completed close to 70% of his passes. I haven't looked at the total final stats, but close to 70% of his passes after coming back from the injury. And again, not at 100%. The storyline with Ewers will now shift to Steve Sarkeesian and his ability or inability to get him interested in Texas. That's something we will follow as we go forward. However, the class of 2021 for Ohio State basically has one guy left on the table. We all know who it is. Defensive lineman JT Tuamolau out of the Seattle area. Bill, I normally don't get too wrapped up on any one individual recruitment unless it's a quarterback because Ohio State has done such a good job across the board. But as I look at the LSU offense of last year and the Alabama offense of this year, the only way to beat one of those teams is to have truly elite defensive ends, one on each side who's a top 10 pick, and then a truly elite defensive tackle so that you can rush just four and get it done. We have Jack Sawyer, who's one of the ends. We have Mike Hall in the middle. JT Tuomolau could be that other end. More importantly, if they don't get him, he would be going to the enemy in Alabama. It's now a Nick Saban, Larry Johnson cage match. Bring us up to speed. Am I making too much of a big deal out of this? And how do you see it all working out and when? Well, uh, I don't think you're making too much of a big deal out of it because he's the number one player in the country and um, uh, at a position of need, like you said. I, I think recruiting-wise, you know, the, at the top of the list is getting a great quarterback in a high state has done that with two straight classes now, um, actually going on three. Uh, then after that, I think you, you look at getting two guys of the ability of a Jack Sawyer and a JT to a uh, would just be incredible. 
Um, and I, I do think that there's a reasonable chance it comes down to Ohio State or Alabama. But you know, I, I don't think you can count out any of the other three schools, USC, Oregon, or Washington. But in the end, I, I think it is likely to come down to Ohio State or Alabama. And I've already been asked this many times, you know, what impact does that national championship game have and my answer is the same uh recruits almost never pick their school based on one game it just doesn't happen very often almost never so you know i think in the end i stayed in their favor has got larry johnson and that's really big will that be enough i i think uh, it could, but I think it's important that JT visits Ohio State. We don't know if that's going to happen for sure yet. He really wants to do it. And if that happens, I continue to like Ohio State's chances. He's visited Alabama, by the way. And like Bill said, we are hoping the pandemic allows Mr. Tuomo allowed to get to Columbus. All right, Bill, give us a snapshot of how you expect recruiting to go over the next couple of weeks. Well, um, you know, the Ohio State team is not due back uh ryan day gave them some time off deservedly so uh he wanted to, they've been really basically going uh since june and that included all the covid stuff all the testing etc cetera, etc cetera. uh all the emotional you know losing of players back and forth with covid all that so um it's been quite a haul so he gave them some time off again deservedly so so they're not due back until early february however uh the freshmen are uh soon to be in the early enrollee freshmen they'll be arriving the weekend of january 24th next weekend so uh, the staff will get them started and they will also continue, as we talked about, recruiting for 2021. Uh, one other guy I might mention is hasn't made a fine, you know, hasn't made a quit yet is Rajon Davis, the linebacker. They would still like to add him. Um, uh, you know, it looks like he's going to go to USC, but you never know. We'll see what happens. Um, and then, of course, 2022 and 2023 recruiting. Uh, they are starting to offer more 2023 guys. They offered the country's number two um, linebacker yesterday uh, from the class of 2023 and they'll continue to make 2023 offers uh, but the main you know focus right now is 2022 recruiting and they've got a great start with nine commitments um, you know I, I think that uh, uh, they've got a chance to get another commitment or two in the in the coming weeks here um, I mentioned in one of the articles I wrote a few guys to keep an eye on, including Keon Grays, the wide receiver from Arizona. So, so 2022 recruiting now is full speed ahead, and, and it's a great class that they're forming. We appreciate Bill stopping by. Please don't contact him this evening. He's busy. Have a good <laughs> one, Buckners. 